Most of the sugarcane fields in the Dominican Republic run all the way from Santo Domingo to the eastern end of the island. They were once active, vibrant enterprises. Many of the workers in the cane fields were migrants from Haiti. They came over and stayed in what was built as a harvest season temporary camp. Over the years, the sugarcane fields closed down those owned by the state. They were enterprises not properly run, ultimately going out of business. The camps then became permanent home to unemployed Haitians. Haitians in the Dominican Republic are treated as badly as immigrants anywhere in the world. In the eyes of the Dominican government, they simply don't exist. And that failure to have an existence or personhood means no health care, no employment opportunity, no ownership of property, and that's exactly the population that we encounter in the little village of El Mame. is located outside of a little town called San Antonio de Guerra, which is located about 30 miles east of San Antonio and Santo Domingo. How did we find El Mame? How did we find Guerra? And that story goes back to how the Sister Parish Ministry here at Our Lady Star of the Sea uh, came into existence. Several of the men in our parish had completed either Curcio or the CHIRP retreat program and felt that our faith had developed. We were seeking an outlet for that newfound, strengthened uh, fire in our faith life, an outlet that would allow us both to deepen our faith and to put it to work in service to others. In pursuit of that opportunity, we sent a request for information to Catholic Relief Services. They, in turn, described for us, uh, through a handbook that they have for Sister Parish Ministries, described for us the concept of a solidarity-based partnership between a relatively better off, in terms of material things, northern parish, and a relatively worse off, in terms of material things, southern parish, which could be anywhere in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. The key characteristics of a successful partnership CRS told us, were first and foremost to focus on relationships more than resources. Establishing a connection faith to faith between the two parishes. It's really a, a mutual solidarity where the relationship extends in both directions. They said that we should focus on um, and emphasize the equality of the gifts. The Northern Parish has something to give 
but they also have room to receive a lot. Pope John Paul II said once, no one is ever so poor that they cannot give more, and no one is ever so rich that they cannot receive more. As we developed our understanding of Sister Parish partnerships in concept, Catholic Relief Services sent the request for information on to a man named Father Mario Serrano, who was in charge of the Jesuit refugee program in the Dominican Republic. I think somebody sent me an email that there was a couple of guys that wanted to come here and know the reality. So I started to, to have a conversation by email. Very interesting because I have such a bunch of emails. <laughs> but that one, I, re I respond to that one immediately. Father Mario contacted us. We described our interest in Sister Parish, and he said there were two parishes he thought we might uh, find interesting and who might find interesting a relationship with us. The first was in the city of Santo Domingo in one of the poorest barrios or urban slums called Juan, uh, Los Guandules, um, and it was called Domingo Savio. The second was San Antonio de Padua, a rural parish in the rural community of San Antonio Teguera. That beautiful music that you heard at the beginning of this video was the choir and congregation of San Antonio de Padua at the Mass on Labor Day morning when our mission trip visited Guerra and subsequently Mame. Uh, they want to, to see the reality, so I took them to the poor neighborhoods of Santo Domingo and then I told them you have to go to the Batallas because in those places you will find like the extreme poverty in this country. So that's the way I met them and I share with them what I know, the reality of the people. We visited one of the bates, a bate known as El Mame, uh, where it was clear that housing was dilapidated, the school was uh, virtually non-existent, the chapel needed repairs, uh, uh, the water and sewer and electrification, everything imaginable. It was literally a seasonable uh, migrant worker camp lived in full time by 350 people. It was uh, a dreadful place. The plan over the next five years is to rebuild or improve in some fashion the houses of all of those 350 people, to rebuild the school, to rebuild the chapel, uh, to install a water purification system, to rebuild the latrine area and the sewage system, including the storm drainage system. That's an ambitious undertaking. The housing in Mamey is, is poor. Really, the primary concern is just trying to provide a safe, sound structure, provide a roof over someone's head, provide a bed for them to sleep in. Um, in some cases, places are incredibly dark, lack of ventilation, lack of light, uh, and dirt floors. Really, I think there's, there's a number of needs there. We had a framing group, an electrical group, and a, a concrete group. The framing group was led by Gene Polk, and their job was to frame and roof the barracks area and to put the doors and windows in. The wiring team was to provide electricity, a, an overhead light and a light switch and an outlet in each of the eight uh, living units that we refurbished. The wiring team, by the way, was led by Ryan Bartell, uh, the concrete team was led by Tony Hartman, and their job was to, to resurface or parge the floors, to provide concrete steps into the units on both sides, and to repair the walls, which were old concrete block walls, to the extent that they had to be repaired. The purpose generally, though, of the barracks team was to make habitable eight dwelling units. And when I say dwelling units, I'm talking about 10 by 10 or 8 by 8 rooms to make those habitable so that people living in uh, separate housing could move temporarily into the barracks while their housing is being rebuilt. When we left on Sunday night, the roof was on, all of the units were painted inside and out, they were wired with an overhead light and a, and a plug in e and a switch in each unit. You could walk up steps to get into the units on both sides of the 
structure. Uh, by Wednesday of the week after we left, we left on a Monday, by that next Wednesday, two days later, there were people moving into those barracks units. The individuals of MOME are certainly willing and able to to do construction work, to do things to better and improve their situation. A lot of times they just need someone to, to guide and direct them. The medical mission, headed by Don Barnhorst, in, a, in, a, in one sense it's obvious what they're going to do. We're going to provide health care, basic primary health care, for the parishioners in both the rural and the urban parish. Um, it's more than that. It's providing health care for families from the pregnant mothers uh, through the 80-year-old men uh, and women uh, who, for whom the end of life is not comfortable. We went to El Mame this time without any previous uh, advance notice that we were going to be there. And we showed up uh, early Saturday morning and uh, a lovely lady named Claudia who lives there began spreading the word that uh, there was a medical team there that would, would see the patients. And before long, we were just inundated with people. And the, the one feature that uh, really struck me was almost all of the little kids showed up in their Sunday best clothing, that the mothers uh, were so pleased that uh, there was someone to care for them, someone that showed some interest, that they were going to respond by having the, the children wear their very best. So I think we were, we were, uh, we were met and received uh, far better than I might have imagined. It was just really very heartwarming. The patients really have largely the same conditions we have here. Very high incidence of hypertension. I'm sure a significant incidence of type 2 diabetes, which we were not equipped to assess while we were there. Um, a, a lot of malnutrition problems with secondary anemia, uh, but uh, they're, they're the kinds of problems that uh, are, are eminently treatable. I was surprised, given the high incidence of uh, high blood pressure, that we saw very few patients with uh, myocardial infarctions or angina, uh, symptoms of, this, uh, of inadequate blood supply to the heart. We saw one patient with a completed heart attack, but not a single patient uh, complained of, uh, of angina pectoris while we were there. So it's uh, going to be worth exploring to find out why the severe degree of hypertension, and I mean significantly elevated blood pressures, why they aren't associated with more incidence of patients with, uh, with active heart disease. When you don't have basic medical care, anything is an improvement. We definitely need specialists. We need medicines, basic medicines, Tylenol, and acids, things that we can go and just purchase over the counter um, would be a great help. But we do need people to come down. We need good doctors and nurses to come down and help with our mission. This is not uh, envisioned as a one-and-done venture. Uh, if we commit ourselves to offering treatment to these patients, we also commit ourselves to follow-up. So we'll be returning at least every, uh, every three or four months to make sure that the patients uh, are progressing as they should with whatever therapy we recommend. My wife Peggy and I kind of stepped up and we kind of moved to accept the position of the motherhood mission. So. I guess from my background with CHIRP, being spiritual director for Women's CHIRP, I'm the only guy that deals with all the women here at CHIRP, so it was very natural for me to just step in and deal with the motherhood group, which is a blessing, it was a real blessing. On our motherhood team, we were fortunate to have two physicians, uh, Dr. Kathy Bing, who is an obstetrician who does many deliveries here, and Dr. Laura Beverly, who is a pediatrician. So what we did was gather the women together and what Kathy and Laura did was give presentations. After they made the medical presentations, they took questions and answers from the women there. And then they, we broke up into groups. And breaking up into groups, then our team, we were team in twos, met with like five women at a time on our teams, and we had five teams of twos, and just talked. Because our primary mission there was to offer emotional support, and just to let these women know that we're there for them, that we care. It isn't a one-time thing. We're going to be back many times in the future. We just figured that we would kind of break the ice by getting to know some of the, the women and um, finding out what was important to them and 
hoping that going forward we'll be able to fill some of their needs and create a game plan. And I think we have a clear game plan ahead of us. The look on their face, the joy on their face when we said we will be back. And I, and I said to them, and when I come back, I'm going to hold your babies. Cause, because by that time, they would have had delivered their babies. I said, I want to hold your babies. And the, and the joy in their face that we actually will come back. We actually will continue to follow them. And we actually, you know, it's not just a one-time thing that, that's happening. It's a continuation of, of what we plan on doing. So I think that that was so rewarding. To others that may be thinking about it, I know there's obstacles that are always in the way. There's challenges, logistical hurdles to overcome, but it is a transformational trip, not only for the villagers, but for yourself and for your life and for this parish. I can't say enough about, uh, yes, it will be life-changing because it has to be. Um, when you see how, how the people, how warm they are, how, uh, how, and how poor they are, and they're happy, and they, they look happy, they look, they look at peace, because they know, I think they realize that, that God is going to take care of them. You know, they don't know when and how, but they think they realize that God will take care of them, God will provide, and that's what we have to do. We have to share what we have with them. If you've ever thought about it, do it. Don't think about it, just do it. You will be so grateful that you did and you will have a wonderful time and you'll take away so much more than you've really put into it. I would, I would just say if you've just even got a little inkling, just go ahead and do it. Yes! Come to Batema May, don't stay there. You will, you will enjoy a lot. There's a lot to learn here. A lot to give and a lot to receive. Thank you, our ladies, for the sea. God bless you. <laughs>
at our prayer service, which will be held each week when mission trips are traveling. If you want to support us in any of these ways or others, or if you just want to learn more about Sister Parish, please contact us at Sister Parish Ministry, all one word, Sister Parish Ministry at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 oh,